What's up chili doggies? Welcome to another video of some guy talking about Sonic games. In this video, we're going to look at exactly what is so difficult about making games that are about going fast. Then, as a thought experiment, compare games that use flow and momentum in a way that could work in the context of Sonic games, just as a thought experiment. I'm not here to jump on a bandwagon of Sonic trashing or Sonic praising. We're just talking. We're just passing the time. We're all here. We're all bored as heck. Sonic has cast a big blue shadow <laughs> over gaming history ever since the launch of the Genesis and Mega Drive nearly 30 years ago. Since beginning this video, I've wondered if that's a measure of the quality of the games or the impact Sonic has had as a pop culture phenomenon. He's a mascot, literally engineered to appeal to children, whose recognizability over the years has caused the series to mean different things to different <clears throat> generations. So here's the thesis, the title of the video, Does Sonic Gotta Go Fast? Going fast in video games doesn't interest me nearly as much as getting into a flow with a player character and building momentum in a way that's reactable. I don't personally enjoy practicing excessively fast levels so they become playable, but I acknowledge that this is a matter of taste. In general, going fast requires that a game becomes fun after practicing. It requires that levels are awkward the first time through, but by hinting at the possibility for speed, a game can entice the player into getting better. Moving quickly makes levels more difficult. This is an interesting way of managing player skill at the game. Oh, so you think you have the map memorized? Well, we'll just bring it on screen faster. Oh, you remember that part too? We'll bring it on screen even faster. Oh, you think you can go real fast? Well, we'll just lag the camera behind you. Oh, you think you can still go fast? Well then, you're probably a speed runner. I think this principle of practice is the deciding factor between people who enjoy many Sonic games, as well as racing games and rhythm games, which we will talk about later. But before we talk about other games, I want to talk about one of the biggest challenges fast games need to figure out. Visibility. More specifically, the camera. In 2D, Sonic historically has been centered on screen. The major reason I can think of for this choice is so Sonic can quickly switch directions without the camera whipping from side to side. The trouble is that with Sonic centered, he has less looking room in the direction he's running. Sonic CD tried to mitigate this by having the camera sort of move to the side and give him more looking room, but that creates a little bit of a whipping effect when he moves side to side. Sonic 3 Angel Island Revisited has this camera style toggleable, but every other Sonic game seems to just pick one of these for the player to deal with, all the way up to Sonic Mania. Another consideration is how close should the camera be? Zooming out gives you more looking room, but makes Sonic harder to see if his color blue doesn't contrast with the background. If you zoom too close in, you can't see what's in front of you. Also, the farther you zoom out, the slower it looks like Sonic is moving. And if Sonic don't go fast, what be Sonic? Blonic? And lastly, this might be a pet peeve, but the camera has been programmed to lag behind Sonic if he moves too quickly. It also lags behind him when he first does a spin dash or does a drop dash in Sonic Mania. This requires the player to remember what's off screen and account for that when they zip ahead of the camera so that they don't hit something that they can't see. This is in keeping with the idea that going fast should make the game more difficult. Now we move on to 3D. Lord Jeebus, give me strength. How much visibility ahead of the player is fair, and how much is possible within technical limitations? On average, there are 1,080 pixels of vertical visibility for gaming monitors. Widescreen makes it kind of awkward to design a game about moving forward. The best way to account for this is to lift the camera up so you can see farther ahead and lock Sonic down around the bottom of the screen. Secret Rings and Black Knight fumbled this and made Sonic fill the screen, which, while it might look more flashy for Sonic to be shaking his tootsies close to the camera, <laughs> for gameplay, it's a bit dysfunctional because you can't see. You can't see what he's running toward. I think a vertical screen is a great fit for Sonic Dash, except the level designs are kind of boring. It's nice to imagine the production value of Sonic and the Secret Rings, but on a vertical screen and with touch responsive controls instead of motion controls, but Whatever, it's nice to imagine a lot of things. It's nice to imagine not having to record this in a closet versus recording it in a studio because of lockdowns. Loop-de-loops in 3D are kind of a matter of preference also. I personally think a following camera for loop-de-loops looks really cool, but this gives some people motion sickness, which might be why the camera's always shot out to show loop-de-loops from far away in all of the 3D Sonic games. Here's the camera shooting out for this loop. Here's the camera shooting out for this loop. 
Here's a camera shooting out for this loop. You'll never see a camera following through the loop-de-loop. -loop. Maybe it's harder to program, or maybe it just made people get barfy, so they, they cut it out. And now for a small camera movement lesson. In lateral camera movement, aka left and right camera movement, cameras can either truck left and right, or they can rotate left and right while staying fixed on a point. In Sonic Heroes, there are a lot of moments where the camera mostly trucks left and right, which means that the player character always moves in the same directions forward, backward, and left and right. It's like they're on a grid. In other games, they end up circling around the camera, and that means that their degree of leftness, if they hold left, can cause them to curve backward into the direction they came from instead of strafing sideways. I'll also mention a cool section of Sonic Heroes where you can ascend up a column, but the camera stays locked in the middle of the column while the player rotates around it. So they are controlling in two dimensions, but the camera is in a 3D space and they're moving around in a 3D space. I just thought it was cool. I thought it was worth mentioning. Skydiving is kind of strange because gauging depth on a 2D screen is very tricky. So putting Sonic in the middle of the screen blocks your visibility, but moving him around to the corners means you have to triangulate where the approaching hoops or rings or whatever are coming at you to meet Sonic in midair. But maybe that's all part of the challenge. I think it works better in some games like, for example, Mario 3D Land, because you have a literal 3D slider that allows you to tell the depth perception for the level you're doing. And even then, they didn't do many skydiving levels or like flying through hoop levels, because I think they know it's not particularly fun. And lastly, of course, there are the strange, strange sections in the 3D games where Sonic runs toward the camera away from some behemoth or some scary truck. Let's just not do that again. I don't think these moments are designed for playability, but they're for trailers and demos and maybe kids find them cool looking. But you're not, you're not doing anything, you're just watching. <laughs> you can't see off screen. That's it. With all of these challenges, does it make more sense for Sonic to stay in 2D or 3D? As with many problems in life, it depends. I think a vertical screened 3D Sonic could be really cool, but it would probably fit in the category of boost mode Sonic because you're staying on certain tracks going forward and backward to play to the strengths of that screen format. I think widescreen seems suited toward exploration based Sonic Adventure style levels. I also think 2D works best in widescreen because you have looking room left and right, the directions you usually run in. And that's basically the Sonic camera in a nutshell. So we're gonna move on and do some comparing and contrasting with other games that aren't Sonic, but might be a little similar to Sonic, just as a thought experiment, just to pass the time together. So we'll start with a brief look at racing games and rhythm games. The Sega and Sonic All-Stars racing series stars dozens of characters famous for running fast, sitting in cars, going marginally slower than they could run in previous games. But why can't they be on foot? Because Sonic R. Sonic R is the sole reason there hasn't been another on-foot Sonic racing game. People don't like Sonic R. I played Sonic R as a little kid, but I was silly, and maybe I thought it was fun. Maybe it's really not fun. <laughs> maybe my fun was fake. Sonic Team have tried slippery hoverboards before letting those shoes hit the streets again. But I can't help but think racing is a good fit for Sonic. Racing gives incentive for repeating levels to find optimal routes. It makes sense to keep moving without the need for slower platforming sections, whatever that means. Real quick, this wasn't even in the script, but slower platforming sections are silly because the movement mechanics for Sonic are built around him being able to accelerate really slowly and eventually pick up top speed. So the smaller space that you're being asked to move around more nimbly is not built for a character that's that slow and kind of awkward to control. He's built for moving fast over a long period of time, not for navigating these small, slow platforming sections. Then you throw in a bunch of issues that like jump mechanics have, the problems come compound when you start getting into the slower platforming sections. I get why they add them, because they build contrast into a game that doesn't have a lot of contrast, because it's just like, go, 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 forward, forward, forward. But yeah, that's just my little rant about the slower platforming sections. Earlier, I mentioned loop-de-loops in 3D making people nauseous. Mario Kart 8 somehow nailed upside down racing and crazy angles, because it just feels like Mario Kart. And I mean, I don't get nauseous. Then before and after levels, the camera will pull out and you'll look at it and you'll be like, what even? is this structure who built this mc escher alejandro khodorovsky moebius mobius is a really good joke because sonic games take place in mobius and then moebius is also known for making mobius strips so 
that makes that even funnier. Rhythm games. Thumper is a game that I wouldn't recommend for anyone sensitive to flashing lights and intense drum and bass music. But if this footage intrigues you, you might enjoy it. It's sort of a rhythm game, only the music isn't memorable as much as it is impactful. The player has to perfectly turn left and right, hold up or down to hit notches on the tracks, and time their thumping during tracks and boss fights to gain life and keep their combos going. Unfortunately, rhythm games, while challenging, are based on memorization. And even though memorization is a skill, it lacks depth gameplay-wise. It's why, over time, DDR has lost popularity, so did Guitar Hero, so did Elite Beat Agent, so did Rhythm Heaven, so did Guitaru Man, so did Donkey Konga, so does... Well, actually, I don't know if Taiko no Tatsujin is still popular, but... It, I, it's, it's a rhythm game, so let's uh, do some research. Still, somewhere underneath Thumper, I imagine an on-rails Sonic game where the cues ahead are just subtle enough to be reactable, and the music is just catchy enough to keep you coming back to rehearse the tracks and getting your high score. Alas! A boy can dream of many realities beyond his own. So those two examples are firmly in the practice makes perfect camp. But what about what I mentioned at the start of the video, that moment to moment flow? Games that flow, the messenger. What the messenger lacks in speed, it makes up for in flow. All the messenger's moves complement the idea of continuous movement from one point to the next. Large portions of the game can be traversed without touching the ground. The late game is a 2D exploration adventure, meaning you repeat areas a few times. Repetition means you're more likely to learn the optimal route through areas, and your knowledge of levels saves time when you need to backtrack. At no point does the messenger whip himself forward so quickly that the camera trails behind. The camera always keeps pace and instantly switches between screens, and this is a slight spoiler, but a later mechanic in the game that changes level layouts also happens with zero lag, which is great for speedruns and flow and all of that stuff. Speaking of which, speedrunners! This is a competitive side-scrolling racing game where you have a few different abilities to screw over other players as everyone tries to run through the level. In most levels, you can see far ahead of yourself and a branching path. You can try to select the path that looks the fastest and dodge the bullshit that your competitors throw at you. It's a really neat concept that shines in the multiplayer environment. Notice how if the camera were zoomed in on the runners, sure they might look like they were going more quickly, but you wouldn't be able to see what's in front of them. Even though they make up a tiny fraction of the screen, the backgrounds are usually very simple so that the characters can contrast against it. Mwah. Mirror's Edge is the free-running game. Level designers took great pains to mark the path forward in some ways that are obvious, in some ways less so. Some folks still called this trial and error gameplay, which is a similar criticism that some Sonic games get, so maybe Sonic fans would like this too. I don't know, I'm just spitballing here. Or should I say, spinballing? Mirror's Edge's design is probably worth a whole other video, but I really appreciate the first-person perspective. The only thing limiting your visibility is the pixel density of your screen. This allows you to look into the distance and plan your next moves. In some cases, you can plan a couple moves ahead of time. Nothing obscures your vision except some camera shaking and body movements. There's also rolling, but I don't think this kind of rolling would work at all in Sonic games. Barf. This is barf. This is barf embodied. Dust Force is a game about quickly cleaning up dust. The longer a combo you have, the more quickly and smoothly your character will move through the course. This is also a practice-heavy game, but I want to focus on the simple scoring system. A perfect score is an unbroken combo. Anything less than that is incrementally marked down from perfect. I think easy-to-read scoring systems can be pretty important. Sonic Generations tells you how close you are to the next time ranking. This gives the player a concrete goal to work toward. Something that bugs me is vague ranking systems that give you a low score without any hints at what you're supposed to do differently, which does happen in Sonic games from time to time, as well as other games. It's a larger issue. Ori and the Will of the Wisps. This game looks so fluid, and the player is clearly making tons of choices to move themselves through the level. Sure, there's a lot of rehearsal to speedruns like anything, but this game, like The Messenger, is built around flowing from one move to the next. Sometimes you attack, sometimes you dodge, sometimes you use these combined skills to reach secrets and goodies. Some of the most fun I had in the first Ori game was after unlocking all the basic moves, backtracking through levels to pick up all the skill orbs. Like The Messenger, you're rewarded for your skill by being able to move quickly through the stuff that you're already familiar with. 
Celeste and Meat Boy. I know these games are very different, but their commonality is that they have a small player character, which ensures you have a ton of visibility for what's in front of you. These games also require a ton of practice to play well, and watching someone play them well makes the game look easy, but it's not easy. You'll die hundreds, if not thousands of times over the course of these games. I couldn't even beat Meat Boy. It was, I couldn't even beat Meat Boy. Oh boy, it was just, it was too much for me, <laughs> but I respect it. I, I don't think it's unfair. Speaking of unfairness, let's get back to Sonic. The better Sonic is played, the less of it you'll see on screen. I'd describe these games as a rampage, then a slight pause or a set piece, a mid-air trick, and maybe at some point a slower platforming segment, and then you rinse and you repeat. It really is fun watching Sonic go fast, and this hooked people in the 90s and has still hooked them to this day. In the 90s, we didn't even have good internet. We were impressionable. It certainly worked on me. I loved Sonic. I almost cried the other day listening to Endless Mind Zone. I hadn't heard it in like 20 years, but some part of my little baby brain just remembered, oh, oh, I played Sonic a Knuckles collection on the Windows ME Millennial Edition. And hearing that song again made the memories come flooding back like magic. In my opinion, Sonic games take practice before they become fun. And maybe practicing is fun for people. Showing speedruns and playthroughs for people is what Sonic is all about. Showing off the results, not the process. So is there hope for Sonic as a platforming adventure? I don't know. Sonic Mania 2 is, I'm pretty sure, in development. People are making mods, feature-length video essays, custom levels, speed runs, fan fiction, artwork, and more, all expressing their love of Sonic games and the characters. There are amazing Sonic-like games, including Spark the Electric Jester, which seems like the Sonic adventure game that people have wanted since the mid-2000s. I haven't played it, but it looks like Sonic. Look how Sonic-y it is. The Hedgehog's Dilemma is an old metaphor for intimacy, in which hedgehogs preparing for winter get close to each other to keep warm in a group. An array? A prickle? A schmedge? A schmedge of hedgehogs? But when they get too close to each other, they risk pricking each other with their quills. Yowchi, yowchi, ow, ow, ow. In Sonic the Hedgehog's Dilemma, rather than warmth, we want speed, but the more of it we have, the more likely we're going to get frustrated or at the very least punished by the game. And the choice is ours. Do we keep trying to go fast, or is the pain of trying too intense? Was this Yuji Naka's design intent all along? And if so, is he a genius? Is the mark of genius making something that people will talk about up to 30 years later or more? Yeah? It's hard to say whether the future holds another up or down for the blue blur. The 2020 film has done well, and people like Sonic Mania. Maybe in the end, going up and down is what Sonic will always do. Uphill slowly, downhill quickly, through the loop-de-loops, and fingers crossed, not into a pit of spikes. Please comment below if this stuff made sense to you, if it didn't make sense, or you disagree, or if you agree. I don't really care, I'm just curious what people think. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. We have a Patreon if you want to support us and hopefully give us the chance to do more in-depth videos like this in the future. 